We have Jim Dieso and Lillian White and Heather De La Riva and Bob Wilkins and Rick Kinsella. Okay. Did I leave anybody out? Okay. And we have our library director with us tonight, Carolyn Gerakopoulos. Hello. And the co-chair co of the steering committee for the capital campaign for the new Oneida Public Library building project, Brad Adams. Yep. Hello. Okay. Each year, a week before our budget vote and election of trustees, we hold this event to inform the public about those candidates that are running for a trustee seat and also the operating budget that we're presenting for public approval. This year, we've chosen not to increase our operating budget for the next <coughs> fiscal year. And so this year, well not and so, but this year, we're holding a referendum to gain approval for the acceptance of an award from the U.S. Department of Agriculture that will enable us to begin construction of a new Oneida Public Library. Therefore, the purpose of this meeting is to first inform the public about the candidates running for the Board of Trustees, and second, to present information about the referendum to gain approval for the acceptance of the award from the USDA. There will be two presentations. The procedure will be as follows. First, following each presentation, I will ask if there are any statements or questions that pertain to the presentation. Next, a person will be limited to one statement or question at a time, not to exceed three minutes. We won't have any questions until the presentation is finished. When a person is called on for a statement or a question, please state your name and your residence. Now we have asked that anyone who has a, a prepared statement, uh, we have asked you to sign up. And the sign up sheet is in my hand. But if you <laughs> want to sign up, Rick is back there with another piece of paper and you can sign up, okay? All right. Uh, any questions as to the procedure? Good. All right. The first presentation will involve candidates for a seat on the Board of Trustees. We have one candidate, and that is incumbent trustee Jim DSO. Jim? Thank you, Pat. Uh, as Pat said, my name is Jim DSO. Uh, I've been on the board for, for one year. Uh, I've lived in Oneida. My wife and I have lived in Oneida for 37, 38 years and have raised three kids in this community. Um, all of our children are adults, and, but we remember the times when uh, we were a young family in Oneida. And uh, Debbie would, uh, well, mostly Debbie, not so much me, <laughs> would take the kids to story hour. And it was a great place to meet, meet other young families, to uh, you know, engage the kids. And uh, Oneida Library has always been a very important uh, Part of our community just like our schools and our hospitals and <clears throat> it's uh, it's a pleasure and I'm very proud to be a board member I uh, joined the board uh, about two and a half years ago I retired uh, <clears throat> from New Hartford Central Schools in uh, June of 2012 um, as the technology director for 16 years but prior to that my career was also in technology I was in educational sales for years, <coughs> five years. I was a technology trainer um, I was a classroom teacher, so technology has been uh, a very important part of my life. And uh, part of my role of, of volunteer work with the library, on Wednesday mornings, I join a couple of other board members, Rick Kinsella, um, Bob Wilkins, a couple of other folks uh, who have technical backgrounds like Kevin Roy. And uh, we're here every Wednesday from 9 to 10, uh, providing technical support. Not to all seniors, but mostly seniors. Um, but uh, you know, I think that's a, I, I think, and many of the board members feel that uh, you know this library that we're ready to hopefully move from, you know, it's got issues. And uh, this vote coming up is about the future, and technology is, is an important part of our future. Um, it's you know, a library is is really more. It's a, it's a community center, and this this library is going to have those facilities to support those those endeavors. Um, 
So uh, that's pretty much a little bit about my background, uh, you know, um, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, I can rely on your support <laughs> uh, in the, uh, to be reelected to the board. Thank you very much. Any questions for me? I'm wearing, uh, I think, Nautica tonight. <laughs> he was concerned. About Inside joke. <laughs> Did anyone sign up to make a statement about Jim? Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it <ain't> too long. <laughs> I, you might be wondering what that thumping is. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. They're, chopping ice, they're chopping icicles and things. This is an old building. It's got lots of problems. Huge icicles are one of those problems. <laughs> All right, next. Um, okay. Next week, the residents of the United Public Library District will be asked to determine whether the OPL may accept the award from the United States Department of Agriculture. Brad Adams, co-chair of the steering committee of the capital campaign for the new library project, and Carolyn Jarakopoulos, our director of the OPL, will now present information regarding that award and the impact <coughs> on district residents. Brad and right. Carolyn. We've got some charts here. The idea is that we want everyone, we know there are a lot of, qu uh, a lot of questions about this, so we want to make sure everyone understands here what we're talking about here. So you know, our library is 60 years old, and the way this library was built 60 years ago, libraries are very different then than they are now. And a good example of this right here is the size of the library, and people are asking, why do we need a library that's 18,000 square feet. Well, the standard uh, for libraries is one and a half to two square feet per resident. We have 15,411 people in our district. So you can see that would suggest a library using library standards of starting at 22,600 square feet at a minimum going up to 30,800 square foot at a maximum. We are not proposing and we are not the, the, uh, ascertaining that a library should be more than what we've recommended here for the moment, 18,000 square feet. You can see where we're right now, 8,800 square feet. Our library is very full, right Carol? It's very full. In fact, this room, according to the firemen, 30 people maximum. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, we are supposed to be complying with the American for Disabilities Act. Which we are not. We are so non-compliant that it's very embarrassing to the staff that works here that has to help these people. In fact, a ramp right now is not even legal. We do not have an automatic door that opens. Our staff has to run out and help these people up the ramp. People in a motorized wheelchair, they do not have access to downstairs. We have an elevator, but people in a motorized wheelchair <coughs> do not fit in it. So they cannot access any of the books, any of the materials downstairs. To me, that's very embarrassing. It should not be. But in the new library, all one floor, totally handicapped accessible. We will be in compliance. So, you can kind of get a picture in terms of the size, why we're proposing the size library we are. So, even though the recommendation is a minimum of 22,600 square feet, we think for the initial, and it's certainly there are some <coughs> opportunities for us to reduce it, we think 18,000 square feet will be sufficient. Now let's take a look at a comparison with our peer libraries. Oneida currently spends on its budget here at the library twenty-seven forty-one per per resident here in the Oneida Special Legislative District. That compares to Canastota at thirty-three or oh, thirty-two eighty-three, 
uh, Chipnango 3454 and Casnovia at 5873. We put that in perspective because the, the proposed library is going to have us increase our budget in order to be able to pay for the library. But what we wanted to illustrate is to make sure that people understand we do not spend a lot. We probably sp we spend less than any other library in our in our area, and we are in the smallest library right now in our area. Anything you want to add to that, Carolyn? Or? Our budget. But people may question our budget. We are not increasing it this year. Our budget is bare bones. Believe you me. We our staff is paid. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about what our staff has paid. Some of our staff members at the desk are on food stamps. Shameful. Our, we cannot keep up with the building repairs because there is not a budget for that. We have very, very bare bones budget. So I work very hard at keeping it that way. And it's a struggle, believe you me. <laughs> so the facility that we're in is the same facility that was in place when the high school was over on Main Street, when the hospital was over here across the street. So the, the schools have been updated, the hospital's been updated, city hall's been updated. <coughs> The library is really the last major piece of infrastructure in the city of Oneida that has not been updated. So, let's talk about the cost of that. Because this is really where people have had some questions and we want to make sure we understand that the cost of the construction of the library of the building itself, 4.4 million dollars. That comes out to 244 dollars a square foot. That is below the national average of 248 dollars a square foot for building a library. The additional costs that go into that, there's obviously things like the architect, the technical support, there's a certain amount of them administration and dealing with when you're dealing with the USDA and with other uh, grants. other grants and so forth and then there's a contingency built in a 10% contingency so certainly we start down this road we don't know once you start if anyone's ever had to build anything before they know you can't be a hundred percent sure cost so there is a contingency budget built in we hope we don't have to use that so, how are we paying for this now? So far, we have raised $2.3 million in donations, pledges, and grants right here. And that what we anticipate that right uh, coming up to a total of $3 million. And then the balance, $3,110,000, is in the form of the USDA loan. Now, we've heard the term, uh, you know, we, you might ask, wait a minute, you just said a $3 million loan. Aren't we voting on a $5 million, $5 million loan? Let's make sure we understand how this is all going to work. I hope, I hope the numbers, everyone can see that. It might be a little small. The total cost of the project, $6,120,000. That's everything. The land, the building, everything. Donations and grants, 2.3 million, and we anticipate raising another 710,000 in additional donations and grants. That leaves the balance to be funded of 3.11 million. So, the USDA federal loan, the 5,067 is a pre-qualification. That's what they've made available to us. That doesn't mean we have to go out and use it, and we don't intend on using all of it. But the USDA, when they make those, uh, when they make those 
qualifications. They want to make sure that once we start this project, it's going to be completed because they're not going to make honey available to us and then have the project go halfway and then have someone's pledge or commitment or grant that they don't have control of pulled out from under us. I don't think the Gorman Foundation or the Savings Bank or anyone else is going who have been so good in terms of making pledges to us are going to change their mind. However, from the USDA's perspective, they want to ensure that's going to be completed. So of the $5,067,000, we expect to utilize $3,110,000. That'll be at a rate of 4% over 30 years. That will leave a balance of close to $2 million in that, in that qualification and that commitment that they made to us that we don't anticipate using. And we have no plans on using it because our intention is not to saddle uh, or create anything more than what we need. So that gives an overview. I hope I've answered and hope cleared up any, uh, any misconceptions here. Okay, thank you, Brad and Carolyn. Sure. <laughs> the formal presentation is complete. And now we will, uh, <clears throat> those of you who have statements, we're going to hold off on the statements until we take some general questions. Uh, questions to clear up any points of information that Brad and Carolyn will be able to answer. Okay? So, if uh, you would like to ask a question once I call on you, please just give your name and uh, your residence. Okay? All right. Who has a question that they would like to ask Brad or Carolyn regarding the presentation? Okay, no questions at this time. So we'll move on to the statements, all right? We can go through the statements in the order in which you signed up. And remember, there's a three minute limit on the statement. So first, if uh, Fred Cianfraco, yep. would you like to make your statement? Um, and we're, go ahead, say your name and uh, where you live, just so I- Well, I didn't remember. even know what we were gonna do here today. But. I'm not a library person, but that doesn't mean just because I'm not a library person that I don't want. But what I want to do is I want to see through the previous library what its use is. And I came in yesterday and I talked to Caroline and she really filled me in very nicely. And it's nice to have good and high hopes. Um, Brad's presentation, the only problem is with everybody's presentation it's always one side when you say you're comparing it to other facilities and I is by itself if I were to compare my business to other other places or if they try <coughs> to run a business here they couldn't do it the way I do it everybody runs a business and or a library for specific needs in this location so it's nice to have the other comparisons give you something to go by and the number of people that you have here doesn't mean that that's the number of people you actually got coming to the library. Again, I'm not a library person. Neither are my kids. But my kids are educated. My son is a professor uh, on and off, depending if he's doing too much other work, but he works at RIT. He used to work for uh, Intel, but he's never gone to the library. Uh, he's married to a school teacher. He doesn't go to the library. Her brother's a uh, doctor. He doesn't go to the library. But that doesn't mean we don't need libraries. I just want to make sure that with the economy the way it is today, and it's very poor, especially here. I don't care what it is outside. Right here in Oneida, the economy is very poor. That it, the money allocated seems to be excessive at this time. I don't think we reviewed it long enough and don't take this the wrong way it it's it almost I, I can appreciate the enthusiasm especially Caroline she's got a lot of enthusiasm and, and that's what keeps this library going and thank goodness that she has that and other people that work here but that's not everybody's the, 
I haven't talked to one person. I've talked to hundreds, probably thousands, that want the library. But that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean we don't want the library. I just think it's an awful lot of money right now. Um, minimally, we can't seem to cut the budget on the existing library. I don't know when those new windows were put in, but they're among the cheapest windows that you could buy. It would help that we would close. There's only one window that is actually closed in this library. Just one. All the other ones are open, not secure, not locked, and air is coming straight through them. We did take the one air conditioner out that was in this room, but we still have the other air conditioners in here. And that would cut the cost of this library for its heating and cooling probably by 35%. And what I'm getting to on that, if we can't take care of this one, we need to be able to take care of a new one if we get one. Okay. Thank you very much. Next, Don Kubiars. <coughs> I wasn't planning to speak, but I will. Um, I know, it was a last minute thing. My name, <laughs> my name is Don Kubiars, and I live directly across the street from where the uh, new library is going to be. And I am absolutely thrilled. I live in a lovely Victorian house. I think it's going to improve um, the neighborhood, the, the, what my house is worth. But more importantly, I think that the library is going to continue to improve uh, my life and the life of my husband and my daughter. We're big library users. We read constantly. Um, I've been bringing my daughter. I brought my daughter here when she was a little girl to the story hour. Um, I moved here 28 years ago, uh, kind of kicking and screaming. And this probably was a, a, a lifeline for me to have this library available. Um, I've worked in the uh, field of criminal justice and addiction for, for uh, I'm in my 35th year. Um, I've worked in this community for 27 of those years, and I can tell you that there are still um, people who cannot read, and people who do not have access to computers, and people who need to come here to learn how to read, apply for jobs online, because you can't apply for a job anymore unless you do it online. I have uh, my clients come here and do volunteer work uh, because they're required to do that. This place has been a godsend to me, to my family, to the clients that I serve, and I, I am thrilled to be uh, living across the street from that new library. Um, I, I, I love the library. I want it to be there. I think it's going to be a wonderful asset, and I hope that everybody else agrees. Thank you. Okay, next, Ed Laudermoser. Ed Laudermoser, 9 West 5th Street, Mighty Castle. First of all, Carnegie's dead. We haven't got any many people uh, donating to build libraries anymore. Uh, do we need a Taj Mahal? It's a pretty god darn fancy looking building for $4 million. Can't we build something a little more economical than that? Uh, how many paid employees do we have now versus what we're going to have to have for the new place? Uh, the top people in this school district, I take it that's the boundary to the library district of the school district? Yes. Uh, a lot of us are retired. We don't have bottomless pockets for pockets, or yeah, pockets for, for money for, for increases. The, the school district has never, ever reduced taxes, for crying out loud, since I've lived here. And I can't conceive of these taxes ever going down either for the new library. <clears throat> I just can't really see why the city gave up that beautiful property over there to build one building on it when they could have built six to ten houses on it and gotten taxes off it rather than having a library there that's going to do nothing but drain taxes for the rest of its career. Uh, I'm not anti-library like the other gentleman says, but I don't believe uh, that this beautiful new building is an absolute necessary. It's a want and not a need. Thank you. Okay, Paul Thomas. I'm sorry. I'm Paul Thomas. I've been a resident of the area for 39 years. Um, I wasn't planning to speak, but uh, if I could address, address Mr. Cianfraco, um, our average patron visits in the library are 80,000 a year, people utilizing this library. And a lot of people do not have either a computer at home or internet service. 
And like uh, Don said, people need to use the internet to apply for a job. Almost any job out there now, you need a job. The kids from school that don't have a computer at home or internet access, they can come here because the computers are tied into the school and they can do their homework here. Um, there are just so many programs, uh, GED program. You aren't going anywhere in this world if you don't have at least a high school education. And uh, the story hours, all the programming here in the library, um, unfortunately this facility is way outdated. The cost of building this, if I remember correctly, the cost of building this uh, facility in today's dollars would be $1.7 million. We're going to build something two and a half times the size of that for three times the cost. So dollar for dollar, we aren't spending a lot of money to build a new library. And that's all I'd say. And next, uh, uh, is it Tracy Dowd? Um, I wasn't actually planning to speak either. Would you, Tracy, <laughs> would you give <laughs> your residence? I live in Kingston, New York. I don't live in Oneida. Um, I didn't even know this was happening tonight, but I came with my mom and I was telling her on the way down here that um, growing up, we live, lived on West Walnut Street. My parents still live there and I practically lived at this library growing up. Um, we didn't have a lot of money and we couldn't afford to do a lot of things and um, this is where I could come and read and hang out and not all of my siblings were big readers but some of us were um, and I really do think that this is an investment for this community and Oneida was a wonderful place to grow up I think it's we want it to stay a great place to grow up and I think that you know we need things like this for the community and for kids who because really not every kid has a computer at home or so that's all I wanted to say thank you all right that completes uh, the names on those who signed up to make statements uh, we can entertain some more questions sure uh, if, as long as they're specifically to the presentation. If you'd like to stand up and give your name, and well, you have to stand up, give your name and your residence, please. I don't have to stand up. Okay. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice of you. I'll stand up anyway. My name is Jim Brown. Residence is 1527 Middle Road. Uh, That's in this district. Uh, what I would like to know is if there's a balance left that we buy from, we get the money from the Ag Department, okay? Obviously, over a period of years, we're gonna pay that back. Right. What are the plans for paying it back? How are we going to come up with that money? And how are we going to pay it back? So that we have a rough idea of, uh, is it going to impact taxes? You know, what what's the thinking on that? Right, right, right. Uh, when the when the borrowing is made, the 3.11 million, that equates to annual debt service of $180,000 a year, and and the taxes, your library taxes, will be increased to what? You say the time of day. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, it comes out <laughs> to about roughly about a dime a day, in terms of the residents. Uh, uh, so. If you take the uh, the total tax base here, it's roughly about seven hundred seven hundred million dollars, and you take the hundred eighty thousand a hundred eighty thousand against that, it comes up to about twenty five cents per thousand, and that's the the library tax is increased to cover that that uh, that annual cost until it's paid, and then it goes away. Okay, how long do you expect the payment period to be? That'll it's that's done over a thirty year period. Taking it out 30 years, huh? Right. And the interest rate is at uh, a rate right now. It's capped at four percent, and it could go down lower than four percent. So, if it goes if it goes down lower, then we we have the benefit of that lower rate, but it'll never go higher. Okay. Okay. 
Another question? No more questions? Well, oh, I'm sorry, Dan Jones from uh, um, East Walnut, the vote is here? Yes. Yes. Next week? Okay. Yes. And uh, from when to when? Noon to nine. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Question. Although we're going to be borrowing, um, during that, you know, because that's, it's going to be some time before it's actually right. physically there. Um, are we going to be doing any kind of fundraising and to continue oh, yeah, possibly? Yeah. I mean, I think I showed here before. Let's go, go back here. There's an additional $700,000 here and additional loans and grants here that we anticipate. Uh, certainly, there were a number of, of, <coughs> of grants we become eligible before once this referendum passes. And I think that's a, a very important point. We have a lot of people who are anxious to participate in this project. A lot of people are waiting to make sure it's going to happen. And, and I think that's the one important thing that people got to realize in terms of what this, as we say, this by pre-qualifying for, uh, for the five million, that doesn't mean we're going to spend it, but it gives us a lot of leverage to go out and be able to apply for grants and for other gifts in order to make this library happen. So the fundraising will continue. Absolutely. Possibly could be less than what we're talking about. It could about. be. We might not need the three million dollars. You know, we'll continue. But we're we're we don't want to promise one thing, you know, we don't wanna we don't want to over promise under over promise and under deliver here. We're trying to give be as transparent as possible, make sure people have all the information out. Okay, another question? I wondered if somebody could uh, <coughs> point up some of the, the things that will be available to people that will save them money uh, in spite of the fact that their taxes might be higher, the, the number of the myriad things to do with the new computer devices that they will be able to get here for free instead of buying them from Amazon.com games. I mean, you people know more about that than or I do. Carolyn, you know, or Jim. Jim but I've been told this is going to be used. Sure. And I'm sorry, I'm Carol Dwyer from the night. Yeah, I think, you know, when we talk about one of the things that we, we spend a lot of time on on Wednesdays is uh, working with uh, my library, um, Zinio magazines that, you know, people pay, you know, People pay magazine subscriptions, $30 a year for a magazine, number of magazine subscriptions. That $30, you know, you don't need to spend that. You can get those resources right at the library. You know, DVDs that people, you know, people will pay Amazon, you know, for, uh, what, you know, $100 a year. Well, if you want to watch Homeland, you don't have, you can, you can come here, get the DVD. It's free. And not everybody's got that money, and that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about, you know. You know, do we want a society where everybody's got to pay for everything? That almost sounds like someone told me un-American, <laughs> and that's what the library is all about. And those resources, and that is a big part of our future. Technology is part of it. That whole digital life. You know, when we talk about things like, you know, how many people, you know, are Blue Cross Blue Shield members that may have had their accounts hacked? And what are you doing about those kinds of things? What do you learn about freezing your accounts? The things that I learned from some of my colleagues that I work with on Wednesdays in the library are things that need to be shared with everybody in our community about your digital life. That's a big piece. And there's a lot of information to share. We can't do that stuff here effectively. I might add a couple of other benefits here, Carol, that, that, that I think shouldn't be overlooked, and that's one, the immediate impact of, of having this project here in the city of Oneida. It's 115 jobs, construction jobs, and with those construction jobs will come uh, certainly a, a lot of ancillary business here from the other, other businesses in the area to support that. Long term, well, there are any new jobs coming to our area. No, it's not Oneida Limited anymore, but companies like New Air and the SUNY Nanotechnology Center. 
and we always are trying to attract people to all to the Oneida Healthcare. These people have choices of where they where they can live, and we want them to be here in Oneida. So we think that that's also one one very important thing. Yeah. Can I just add too that you know um, we have a lot of people come here who have it, you're, you know it is tough times and they don't have the money to have forget internet they can't even afford TV in their home so they come here and they check out eight ten videos and that's their that's their cable because they can do it here that's your your library cost in one one visit boom and. When you're in tough times, that's when you want to share your resources. That's when you pull together, you share your resources, and everybody benefits. That's what you do when you're, you know, a community and you, you need to help each other. That's this is the place you do it. I just want to say I took offense at one of the comments that was printed in the dispatch a week or so ago about miscreants using the library, and I thought anybody who comes to the library is not a miscreant. They're not out burglarizing houses or going to strip clubs. They're coming to the library to improve their life in some way through knowledge or through use of, of the, uh, the computer that they don't have at home. And we as a community should be supporting those people and encouraging people from the halfway house or the people from the other side of town that maybe don't have. Just because we can't can afford all the goodies doesn't mean that our town won't be a better place if we provide things for those who can't afford those things. And that should be part of being a good citizen, in my opinion, of looking out for the, the other people who have less than we do. <clears throat> and since I have to stand up here and say this stuff, I'm going to say two things, too. Uh, the new building will have tons of plugs, <laughs> tons of outlets. I was in here the other day, and I was using my computer and turn off that technology for <laughs> I was using the computer and it was the battery was going down. I was using the, the wireless, of course. The battery was going down, so I plugged in my charger. Uh, another guy was using the wireless on his phone. He had his plugged into the other. Well, another kid wanted to use his computer and they're over there, I this hole. I can't. There's no place to plug it in. I have this big thing. I said, okay, I'm ready to go. Here, you can have my half of the outlet. You know, it's just, it's, it's bad. A new building will take care of that. Two hours ago, where we're sitting, and it's not comfy. I heard the comment, why, you know, we need to ha have this in a bigger room. Well, this is it. This is our meeting room. And two hours ago, this place was packed with families and birds of prey. There was a huge oh. owl about that big. And People were hanging out at the door trying to see these things. The room was filled. And if you could have seen the looks on these people's faces, and a lot of these people, they can't go to the state fair or the, you know, other places and pay the money. They were here, and it was a great thing. And I'm just glad the fire department didn't come in to see how many people. Plus parking. Yeah. Plus parking is critical. Okay, are there any other questions? Um, maybe Carolyn can um, address this because Jim and I both do the technology on Wednesday mornings and I've, I've heard a lot of people say well the, the libraries have no future because you get all the books you need electronically so I, I haven't heard anybody address you know if we can get everything we need electronically what do we need the, the building for Every book you see on our very overcrowded shelves. We have a very strict weeding policy at this library because we are overcrowded. So we get a dusty book. It's called Dusty Book from New York. And every book that has not circulated in the past three years, we discard and give to the friends to sell at minimum. And still we're overcrowded. But we have some 60,000 books on our shelves that have gone out in the past three years. This is the power of a hardcover book. We also have access to ebooks. Every our circulation is growing for ebooks. We have last month 325 ebooks that were checked out through the library. But we also have 7,000 books that were checked out. 
This is monthly. So this is the power of books. So every book you see on this shelf has been checked out in the last three years. Now that is an amazing testament to the usage of this library. But we also have tons of programs. We have an amazing groundbreaking GED program. We also have an ESOL program. And we try, we get lots and lots of comments from people about programs. Michelle has great programs, Tom has great programs. And so we really try to serve everyone here in Oneida. And we take suggestions, <laughs> so if there's something else you would like or need, we will try to help you. Yeah. And we also, we, have lots of, we also have lots of volunteers. Too. And we have many volunteers. We have a wonderful friends organization that struggles. <laughs> you should see our staff bathroom because people bring in their books and we're like, mm, where are we going to put the books? Because there is no storage in this library. And in the staff bathroom, we have one little aisle <laughs> to get to the bathroom. And the rest of the books are stored up to the ceiling. Four of us live upstairs. You saw that. Four of us live upstairs in a fire trap in the attic. That attic has one exit. It goes all the way downstairs. There's a stairwell to the basement. If a fire started in that basement, we would not survive because there is no way out. You saw There's that. No window. There's no window. It drives the firemen crazy. <laughs> that we're up there. But there's no place else. <laughs> in the kitchen that the staff eats at, we have all these shelves <laughs> with all our storage supplies. So we have this little table that we eat at that only seats two. We have a bare bones staff. But we make do. We, or we try to serve everybody in the best way we can. Now, you, you know, you bring up a point, Carolyn, that I think needs to be made, is that even though we're moving to a larger library here, the design of the library is such that we'll be able to maintain the, the, the current staffing. That's right. Because, and that was a question you had, sir. This one-story library, one story, it's an open design, so that from the circulation desk, my staff, the two people that work at the circulation desk, we'll be able to see the whole library. Now this library is a nightmare <coughs> because there's a downstairs that you can't see anything. So at night I only have two on staff so they try to get down there but the staff is busy at the desk. So this is another, it's a security issue here that we will not have there. And, and you know our two biggest costs will be ongoing will be staffing and energy both of which we tried to address here with the that's design right. design that's right so the fact that it's all on one floor like that may make it seem larger when comparison to this library but that's because we're, we're we've got a basement right here and then an upstairs see this library we're used to rooms there aren't going to be rooms in this new library, it's very exciting, it's open. And for our, our handicapped, don't get me started, but for our handicapped. Three minutes. I'm sorry, <laughs> get me started here. But you know, for our handicapped in wheelchairs, you're supposed to be able to go in an aisle of books and go around and come out. Nobody can do that here. It's criminal. <laughs> it's a problem. We need that new library. Can I, okay. can I just add on the on the evil um, quick statement? There's I'm only I'm <laughs> only uh, four percent right now of the circulation is ebooks to begin with. Four percent of four percent of the circulation yep. yeah. is ebooks. So the rest is all still you know book, uh, textbooks. Right. Um, the other thing is that not everything is produced in digital format. I mean you know we.